Hello and welcome back to Sinobabble. In today's episode we're going to be talking about youth unemployment in China. Before we get into what the episode is about, please be sure to subscribe to the channel if you're watching on YouTube and like the video. Follow me on X and Instagram and threads and Substack. The Substack is very good. I write more topical news stories on there. It's very interesting. The content is good, guys. Just follow me. I you won't regret it. Thank you. So we're talking about youth unemployment because a statistic was recently released by the Chinese government basically saying that 21% of people in China between 16 and 24 are currently unemployed. Now, of course, 16 to 24 age bracket, a lot of those people will be in some form of education or they might be in between jobs, still finding their feet in the world, but still 21%, around a fifth, is unusually high. So I was quite interested in what the causes of this were, but more interesting to me was how the government is actually dealing with youth unemployment and looking more at where the responsibility falls for unemployment in China and how young people are reacting to the situation. In the West, it's become very typical for generations to do some infighting over almost everything, but attitudes towards work and employment is one of the biggest topics, especially between the older generations, say Gen X and boomers, as they're typically known, and younger generations like millennials and Gen Zers. So in, say, the UK and North America, it's very typical for people in their 30s and 20s to complain, say, about how their salary doesn't get them as much as their parents' generation, while those who are 55 and older might characterise young people as lazy and having a poor attitude towards work. These are just broad stroke generalisations, by the way. It's more how this debate may play out broadly across the population. In the West as well, we also have the expectation that the market will pick up any slack in terms of unemployment. So if you are somebody who is young and unemployed, it's not because there are no jobs, it's because you are not picking up opportunities, you're not picking yourself up by the bootstraps. And even in the UK, there's something called Job Seekers Allowance, where you can only receive benefits from the government if you are actively looking for a job. We have a mindset that's more centred around what the market can do for you, as opposed to the responsibility of employment falling, say, on the state. China, on the other hand, has a very different approach to youth unemployment. So on the one hand, like in the West, young people are supposed to be very enthusiastic, actively contributing to society. But on the other hand, it's actually the responsibility of the state to make sure that there are enough suitable jobs for graduates. And when I look at the difference in attitudes, I think that that might actually contribute somewhat to the difference in unemployment rates for young people. So in the UK, youth unemployment is around 11%, and in the US, it's around 7%. So people can still find jobs, even if those jobs aren't necessarily the most desirable or well-paid. And like I mentioned, in China, youth unemployment is 21%. So young people can't even find jobs in the first place. When we look at exactly what that means in terms of numbers, around 33 million young people in China have entered the workforce and around 6 million of those people cannot find a job. So 6 million people are actively looking for work. In China, the number of new college graduates reached almost 12 million this year, which is an increase on 1.6 million from last year. The Chinese government has highlighted things such as the slow economic development due to COVID lockdowns and they've also highlighted something they're calling seasonal fluctuations. Basically because people have just graduated it's normal that not all of them are going to find jobs straight away but over time they will be absorbed into the job market. Something that should be highlighted here as well is that each year in China there are more and more graduates so more and more people are going to university getting degrees and graduating than before. This is a trend that's been increasing since the 1990s and it's generally referred to in academia as the massification of education in China and we're going to be talking about that trend a little bit later on in the episode. There's also a lot of competition for specific types of jobs in China and these jobs are usually the ones that are provided by the government. So according to recruitment experts in China, most young graduates still favour metropolises and large companies, state-owned companies and government departments being their top choices, while nearly 80% of market demand is from private companies. Many graduates delay their job-seeking plans until after they receive their civil service exam and in the process miss out on job opportunities. I wrote about this in one of my Substack letters not 
too long ago, but your chances in China, your chances of getting a civil service job is around one in 64,000. <laughs> if it were me, I would assume that I would not be one of those one in 64,000 people, but the difference between working a state or government job versus working as a graduate in a private company is really, really huge from the perspective of these Chinese graduates. Private sector jobs are seen as very unstable because the contracts that you sign can be very unbalanced. Private sector jobs also typify something called the 996 work culture, which is working from 9am to 9pm every single day for six days a week. So only getting very little time off or to yourself. These jobs can often cause burnout in young people. And they all, a lot of these private sector firms don't have things like HR <laughs> or job skills training or development training. So people feel very stuck in their positions. There's little career growth opportunities, lots of nepotism and little opportunity for people to actually develop their skills. Even where people can find good private companies to work for, there's often a huge gap between the skills that they've developed at, during their education and the skills that the job actually requires. This is something that the government is now actively trying to address, but because the government obviously sets the um, economic direction for the entire country, often this means that every five or 10 years, what is prevalent or what is important in the job sector might change drastically. So we've seen with the previous five-year plans in recent years that things like robotics, AI, high-tech industry have become a lot more important. Whereas before, say, as an example, things like skills in banking or softer skills might have been important. So the degrees that people are going for change with the direction of government policy, but because that policy can change at a moment's notice, people often find themselves behind the trend. This isn't just a problem in China. Obviously, this is a problem all around the world, especially now that we're reaching a place where technology develops so much faster than uh, a degree course does. But I think the difference is in the West, private sector jobs can feel a bit more secure, a, a bit more, not a lot more, because we've all seen the tech layoffs that are happening at the moment. Mm. But I think especially if you don't work in tech, even if you don't necessarily have the loyalty to a company that your parents may have had or the ambition to stay with a company for 10 plus years and, you know, really become a member of that community, most people in the UK, for example, still work in the private sector. I looked up the statistics, it's around 80% of people work for the private sector. Despite all the problems and issues that we have with employment right now, the private sector is still more stable. We have a lot more laws and regulation around employment in the UK. We have benefits that every private firm has to adopt. And because it's left up to the market to decide how you know, how much say you should be paid for a certain job, how what benefits you should receive for a certain job. Private companies have to be more competitive. So they are incentivized through that competition to provide good or at least decent benefits for their workers. This is different in China where most people try and go for government jobs and the private sector hasn't really been regulated as closely as it has been in at least Western Europe. So in China, young people are not incentivized to learn about the skills and experience that they need for industry jobs because they are so focused on, say, taking the civil service exam and getting a good state government job that will mean stable employment for the rest of their lives. However, because the situation is changing, we've now got this huge gap in youth unemployment. So another example of how private sector firms differ in China and the West is the sort of requirements that... Uh, someone might be asked to provide when they're applying for a job. So again, down to regulation, competition, things like that. In the UK, for example, it's very straightforward. You submit your CV in a cover letter, you have a few interviews and you either get the job or you don't. In China, the lack of regulation has meant crazy requirements popping up. And I'm not just talking about having to attach a very heavily photoshopped picture of yourself to a resume. There are graduates who have been rejected for not being the right height, for not being from the correct place. Even some people who have been rejected for jobs for not having the right surname. But here's one story as an example. Wu Yuan Yuan, a 29 year old woman in Changsha, Hunan, was asked for her zodiac sign while applying for an accountant position via Jipin, the recruitment platform. Her application was met with silence after she disclosed her zodiac sign, which supposedly clashed with the boss's sign. 
Similar instances have emerged on Xiaohongshu, the lifestyle platform, where several job seekers have shared their experiences. Applicants waiting for staff positions were informed that their zodiac signs conflicted with the employer's preferences. Some job listings went to the extent of placing restrictions on family names, while others dictated that candidates should avoid specific characters in their names or ancestral homes. I think it's also important to mention as another potential reason that a lot of job sectors in China have lost lots of money and therefore had to cut a lot of jobs, not unlike tech in the West. If you remember a couple of years ago, the Evergrande situation meant that the real estate sector took a huge hit and also the private tuition industry also took a massive hit as well when private tuition centres were closed down all across the country. So if we take one example, which is New Oriental, which is, I think, the largest education centre in China, they had to cut 90% of jobs, which amounted to 60,000 private sector jobs. Young people are right in that the private sector doesn't offer a lot of stability because, again, when government regulation does come in, you don't know which sector is going to be hit first. Even in the West, tech jobs aren't secure, but I imagine in China, they're not only highly stressful due to the work hours, but if the government suddenly wants to clamp down on certain internet companies for whatever reason, you are almost guaranteed to lose your jobs. But like I mentioned, unlike in the West, the Chinese government actively tries to help young people when it comes to finding a job. The government in China is very keen to alleviate employment problems for young people, not only by creating new opportunities, but highlighting existing ones that may or may not be seen as attractive by young people. So is it a case that Chinese young people just don't know where to look properly when it comes to finding a job? If we look at June of last year, the Ministry of Human Resources launched a 100-day campaign on June 6th to find 10 million jobs for college graduates and job seekers. In July last year, the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Security also organised four job fairs that attracted 17,000 recruiters, offering 860,000 vacancies. So that's almost a million jobs that were put out on the market last year. The government has been introducing different schemes for young people as well. Things like career guidance sessions, skills development workshops, job recommendation courses. And for people who haven't had a job for a long time, the government is also offering special job training programs to help them potentially retrain and skill up to get jobs. The government is also offering young people temporary employment jobs, which are referred to as welfare jobs. This is for graduates who can't get anything at all after they graduate. These include things such as being a receptionist or a security guard, an office administrator, community workers. You basically get like a one to three year temporary contract while you're searching for another job or you're trying to skill up. So these kind of jobs are kind of looked down on a little bit because they're often for people who are elderly or disabled. They're not necessarily desirable jobs and they don't really pay that well. They're often in smaller townships or just like local communities. Also because they're not a permanent solution, again, it's you've got that job security issue as well. But despite all of this, even the positions in really rural communities have ended up attracting graduates from top universities. And the competition, even for these not very attractive roles, is really, really intense. It's crazy to think that you will have like 10,000 people applying for like a local librarian job, but that's how intense the job market is in China at the moment. The government is also trying to encourage private sector employers to hire fresh graduates, even though they might not be as skilled as they need to be. So under the policy, employers willing to sign contracts with either unemployed college students who have graduated within the past two years or young registered jobless workers aged between 16 and 24 will receive a one-time 1,500 yuan allowance for each young person they hire until the end of December. Employers must make certain payments, such as pension and workman's compensation insurance, to newly hired workers for at least a month before applying for the allowance. The private sector has slowly become a larger supplier of jobs than the government, so the government is very keen to kind of switch people's mindsets around and convince them essentially that working for the private sector is just as good, if not better, than working for the government. And not only that, they're also trying to encourage young people to take up entrepreneurship and create jobs not only for themselves, but for the wider market. 
Since 2015, the Chinese government has issued and implemented a series of initiatives and policies to promote innovation-centric entrepreneurship. In 2015, the State Council issued the Made in China 2025 and the Mass Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiatives. And then throughout the years, they introduced a series of reports and policies that strongly promoted mass entrepreneurship and innovation. In what seems like almost a desperate attempt on top of all of these things, the government also recently issued a kind of call to the countryside (laughs) for young people. So for people who can't find a white collar job, can't find a government job, can't start a business for themselves. The government, along with the Chinese Communist Youth League, has issued a call for people to roll up their sleeves and go down to the countryside, literally like the Cultural Revolution. (laughs) The Ministry of Education is essentially trying to recruit over 50,000 people to join teaching programs and other sort of rural development programs. Last year, there was actually an editorial in the People's Daily Uh, which is the Chinese Communist Party's official newspaper, which said, when you are young, if you choose hardship, you will choose harvest. And if you choose dedication, you will choose nobility, which is obviously a throwback to the idea of the Cultural Revolution down to the countryside movement, where young people were sent to the countryside against their will, by the way. That policy during the 1960s and 1970s was to get rid of young people. (laughs) Young people had been in the way, they had been causing trouble, they were kind of like a burden on the state. And so this seems kind of similar in that these young people can't find jobs to just, you know, send them out of the way, put them in the countryside. And, you know, when when they're done with that, they can come back and like things should have calmed down by them. So obviously that didn't work. There were lots of negative comments about that online. We can never forget that the legitimacy of the CCP rests on people in the country largely being satisfied with their way of life and their way of living as an authoritarian state because you don't have that democratic mandate of the people so people can't just be like well I'll just get rid of them in the next election cycle hopefully the next government will be better you are beholden basically to the fact that people are not going to rebel against your very existence and try and get rid of you because you have no other direct mandate other than people's satisfaction also i I, I keep talking about youth unemployment. I'm well aware that everything that I've kind of spoken about up until now has been about graduates specifically in China, so people with college degrees. I couldn't find any statistics that kind of broke down the different sectors of unemployment by um, say like class or education. So it's not obvious to me if this is only, if this statistic only refers to university graduates or if there are say, blue collar workers mixed in there as well, people who work in manual labour, or if the segmentation doesn't really matter because manual labour is always absorbed by the market because manufacturing is a very big industry in China. Therefore, if you're a migrant worker or a manual labourer, you will always be able to find work. Or if the government just doesn't really care (laughs) about finding those people work. I I couldn't find any sort of like segmentation or breakdown. It seems to be more of a graduate problem from what everything that I've read. But I'm sorry that that's very sort of surface level. I would have, I, I wanted to find out more about um, the breakdown, if this is affecting working class people, if so, in what ways, how is it different? What's the government trying to do for them? But I couldn't find anything about that. So we are left stuck talking about people who are overeducated and unemployed as usual. I also wanted to kind of go on a side note and say that While the government is talking about all of these problems and all the potential solutions, something that they are missing out is the huge caveat that the makeup or the way in which society works in China is also a huge factor in employment opportunities for young graduates, especially those who don't have family connections. Now, if you don't know what guanxi is, I've made another video before about that, so you can go and listen to that and find out all about what guanxi is. But very briefly, it's essentially your social network. It doesn't just apply to, say, people that you're friends with or direct family members. It can be like your mum's best friend from high school might be able to get you a job and that's someone that you can rely on because they're in your sort of wider network of people that you know. Your family background and your family connections do play a huge role when you're a graduate in your ability to get a job. And studies that have interviewed or looked at graduates who are in these situations have tried to point this out. 
The major concern of university students in relation to social mobility may relate to the difficulty of finding a job when they graduate. In particular, if college graduate employment does not only depend on one's education or ability, but also on one's family background and social network, graduates from lower class or disadvantaged families face unfavourable conditions for occupational and social mobility. A recent study based on a national representative social survey of mainland China suggests that family background and social network played an important role in college graduate employment during the massification of higher education. The proportion of college graduates gaining family help increased from 10.6 to 18.7%. In addition, amid the massification of higher education, a large proportion of the family help involved aggressive ways for getting jobs, such as helping with submission of application materials and arranging meetings with the employer's agent. Graduates from lower class or disadvantaged families may have larger difficulties in their employment, even though they hold a university degree. Despite the fact that massification of education has increased access to higher education, this process does not mean enhanced upward social mobility nor promote educational equality. Another study that I was looking at which was talking about entrepreneurship and opportunities for entrepreneurship also touched on this point a bit. One interviewee is now taking care of a family enterprise in northeastern China. Before that, he ran two advertisement startups in Shenzhen and Beijing. My previous startups were out of personal interest because I majored in journalism. My parents' business had nothing to do with the advertisement industry, but I learned many things from their entrepreneurial experience. He admitted that he was more familiar with the business environment than most of his peers. Although he did not rely on his parents for finance, at least not more than others, he benefited from his family's background. So because more and more people are getting degrees, you have that degree deflation that we also are experiencing in the West now, where a degree is just common currency. And actually some employers are turning away from degrees in the West and saying, we don't care whether or not you have a degree, we need you to have actual skills and knowledge. And that's becoming more important. I don't think I need to touch too much on why other types of jobs that I've mentioned that are provided by the government are unappealing. Obviously, if you're going down to the countryside, one huge problem there is that you might not be able to return to a city job or an urban job. Similarly to having the right family background or the fight, the right guanxi connections, where you have worked in the past very heavily affects where you can work in the future. Even though I mentioned that those state jobs where you work as like a librarian or a receptionist are attractive in terms of being able to be employed you're still being paid minimum wage so something like 2000 to 3000 yuan a month which is like 200 to 300 pounds whereas the typical average job salary now in china is more like 8000 yuan so you're already at a disadvantage in terms of your earning capacity at that point and as we all know if you start on a certain salary it's very difficult to kind of jump up from there to a much better one It doesn't help as well that the work that people do is also extremely dull (laughs) and it doesn't really relate to people's skills or education that they've spent years acquiring. A 23 year old graduate surnamed Chen said she beat more than a dozen applicants in August to do a secretarial job at a local agriculture centre in southwestern city of Chongqing. The gap between my dreams and reality is huge, said Chen, who wanted to become a teacher. Chen and another grad, Liu, are both using the slow days at work to study for the highly competitive 2024 civil service exam, which drew a record of 2.6 million applicants, according to state media. If they pass, they would start on one of the most coveted career paths in China, often referred to as the iron bowl of financial stability. Liu never expected to go for the public sector career, but now he's at least happy that he can take that chance. I don't want my parents to see me staying at home all day doing nothing. And then again, if we go back to entrepreneurship, there are many, many barriers to entrepreneurship, which anyone who's tried to start a business will know. These barriers are general, but also they can be specific depending on where you're based. Even in the articles I was reading where people are based in Shenzhen, which is like the entrepreneur capital of China, people were still facing real, even somewhere like Shenzhen, which is supposed to be the innovation and entrepreneurship capital of China, One article I was reading showed that that people still had real problems, both generalised, so problems that any entrepreneur anywhere would face setting up a business, and those specific to China as well. Policies of promoting university graduate entrepreneurship and the open and favourable environment are facilitating factors in big metropolitan cities such as Beijing, Shanghai, Guangdong and Shenzhen. Yet, 
Traditions rooted in Chinese culture and society are still affecting the development of entrepreneurship, positively or negatively. More than 16% of Shenzhen adults working as entrepreneurs, of which a significant proportion are university graduates, experience significant barriers to entrepreneurship, including personal trait-related barriers, resource-related barriers, and culture barriers. Several interviewees mentioned the importance of zuoren, which means to be a doing person in their entrepreneur efforts. Within the Chinese cultural context, this principle highlights the demand for self-actualization and the philosophy of managing interpersonal relationships. They suggested that some people failed in entrepreneurship because they did not ha- know how to follow the Zoran principle. One interviewee said, some people can make money by chance at the beginning, but whether one could be successful as an entrepreneur in the long run is determined by Zoran. Interviewees also highlighted the lack of personal networks, access to understanding market demands. Gender was another issue highlighted by the survey. A relative told me that I should shift my focus from my career to marriage because finding a husband after I reach 30 will be difficult for me. My parents are also anxious about the same matter. They want to arrange blind dates for me, even if I say that I'm happy with my present life. But men also face barriers due to Confucian ideology. When I decided to be self-employed seven years ago, my parents were shocked and strongly opposed my decision. From their perspective, self-employment was not a proper occupation. They thought that only those who cannot find a job went on to become self-employed and it would make them lose face. In our local culture, people only admire those who work from the government. So even where the Chinese government wants to be forward thinking, push people to change their mindsets about the type of work that they do, the type of companies that they work for, they still have to face actual Chinese culture in overcoming these barriers. In the West, we don't have the same barriers. Becoming an entrepreneur is seen as something very praiseworthy, very worth pursuing. We hold our best entrepreneurs in incredibly high esteem in the West. In China, the cultural context and also the the more community-based mindset, right? In the West, we are much more individualistic in our mindsets, in our pursuits. Whereas in East Asia, particularly, the group mindset means that people want to do more of what other people are doing. People want to fit in more. People don't want to be different. Unlike in the West where our differences and the things that make us unique are the things that we cover the most. So these are all real problems that are facing young people in China. And because of that, despite what I've said about people having this mindset where they want to be more like each other and kind of stick together, their response to what the government has proposed may not actually be what you you would expect. In fact, there is some creativity among young people when it comes to trying to find themselves a job. This is personally one of my favorite examples. Song Song felt like her job search was going nowhere. The Beijing resident had applied for more than 30 positions via email and job sites, but she hadn't received a single response. So Song Song decided to try a different platform, the dating app Tinder. The 22-year-old began updating her profile images, replacing her selfies with pictures of a message scrawled in large red characters. Is anyone short of workers? I'm currently looking for a job. Please hire me. Now, it's worth pointing out here that Tinder is not legal. In China, it's one of those banned Western apps. But I think because of that, that actually makes it even more attractive if you're looking for a job, because obviously there's going to be less competition than on a general um, job, like traditional job site or uh, job board, right? And it also means that you're more likely to find foreigners on there. So maybe foreign entrepreneurs who have businesses or connections in China. And therefore you can broaden your work, your job search a little bit to unexplored networks. One Peking University graduate, surnamed Xing, told Sixth Tone that the chance encounter via Tinder had kickstarted her career. Shortly before finishing her philosophy degree in 2020, She went on a date with a man that she matched with via the app and spent much of the evening sharing her anxiety and uncertainty about finding a job. The man, who is now Xing's fiance, just so happened to work for a big tech company in Beijing and was able to give her some useful tips on securing an internship there. Xing managed to secure the intern position and that in turn helped her when applying for other opportunities later on. Apparently there have been some like girl boss manipulation strats that have emerged on this platform as well, which I just think is amazing. Um, So tactics like making the person that you match with feel like a successful man, slowly revealing your anxieties and like your struggles through personal conversation have become tactics for women to try and get opportunities out of the men that they match with. But I think in a context like China, 
I'm kind of on their side because <laughs> it's a lot harder in China for women to get jobs. There's still a lot of discrimination around age, around looks, pressure from your family. Also, if you're pregnant in China, you're at risk of losing your job as well. So I think any advantage, any leg up that you can get really as a young woman in China, you gotta play the game to win, you know? <laughs> Female Tinder users who spoke with Six Tone rejected the idea that using the dating app for networking is anti-feminist. Wu Qianqian, a junior at the University of Sydney, said that exploiting the networking potential for dating was a feminist act that challenges hookup culture. Dating apps are about expanding your social circle. People go to the apps to go on dates, hook up, make friends, even make money. There's nothing wrong with turning it to your advantage. You go, girl. For those young people who aren't able to use their feminine mystique to land jobs, many of them are instead turning to other, again, more precarious opportunities, things like the gig economy. But only 19% of these jobs are covered by insurance, whereas about 50% of regular jobs have some sort of like healthcare or other benefits and things like that. And also because of um, the state of the job market, demand for these types of jobs, you know, like being um, equivalent of an Uber driver or a, a delivery driver, Uber Eats, whatever you want to call it in China has become again, much more competitive. And therefore the rates that you can charge are again, dropping down. There are some people who are trying to kind of move into this pseudo entrepreneurship world, trying to improve their zuoren, if you will. There's this trend of young people taking up menial jobs, things like dog walking, being like a personal tour guide for your hometown, offering to take influencers photos while they um, go to like famous tourist spots and things like that. This is often referred to as doing really stupid jobs in China. There is, there's even some people who, who act as if they're kind of like Greek philosophers on the side of the streets. They kind of sit there and like sell their knowledge on the side of the streets, which I'm, I mean, I guess that's kind of what I'm doing as well. Like I, <laughs> I totally feel for these people because they're basically, you know, they've gone out there, they've spent all their time learning all of these things and garnering all these knowledge and doing what they were told and going to the best universities, studying, getting all the degrees and accolades and things like that, only to come out into the world and for the world to be like, eh, we're not really looking for that right now. Even though there are some people who are taking up these more menial tasks because they don't want their parents to see them doing nothing, as they say, there are some people who seem to have just given up entirely and are now being hired by their own parents as what's known as full-time kids, which all I can say to that is, if we try to pull that stuff off <laughs> in the West, oh my goodness. Like, can you imagine what the Wall Street Journal would write about 20 and 30 year olds who refer to themselves as full-time children? Like, we would be... <laughs> We would be, oh dear, we would never recover from that situation. After finishing his marketing degree last year, Chung Jun was unable to find a single decent paying graduate role. So the 22 year old decided to accept a very different kind of job offer from his parents. Cheng now spends his time at home in East China's Jiangsu province, working as a domestic helper in the apartment where he grew up. He cleans, walks his sister to school and runs errands for his family. In return, he receives a flat wage of 4,000 yuan, or around 500 US dollars, which by the way, is more than what those government jobs were paying. So good for Chung, I guess. Reactions to the group on social media have differed wildly. Many appear supportive towards full-time kids, saying it's good to take time out and spend quality time with family. Yet many others dismissively describe the phenomena as a new type of kenlao, a derogatory term referring to people sponging off their parents, which literally translates as bite the old. But not all parents see it as a bad thing and instead view it as a way to tide their children over until they find a better fitting role. After sending out hundreds of applications, I eventually received just one offer, an office job that paid a bit over three grand a month. That was unacceptable to me and my family. My parents have always taken pride in my academic performance. They believe I deserve a better future. Still, Chung insists that the role will only be temporary. In a few months, he'll retake the postgraduate entrance exam in the hope of winning a place on a master's degree program. <sighs> yeah, like a master's degree is gonna help you out. Sorry, that's, <laughs> that's my own business talking. Let me just continue with the story. Although I get paid for my work, the fact that I get paid by my parents still makes me uncomfortable. With a better diploma, I'll have a better chance of securing a decent job outside the family, he thinks. 
Though most full-time children like Chung appear to view the role as a stopgap, others see it as a long-term job, especially those who have elderly parents with chronic health conditions. Zhu, a 27-year-old from Shanghai, quit her job at a film company and moved back into the family home in 2021. Since then, she spent her time taking care of her parents, who are both in their late 60s and have previously been hospitalised with heart problems. The hashtag going viral has made it easier for me to explain what my job is at the moment. I used to tell my friends I was jobless, now I can directly say that I'm a full-time daughter. With these stories, there's also an element of that Confucian filial piety idea as well, uh, sort of baked in, the idea that people should be looking after their parents and in turn their parents should be looking after them as well. You never really stop being your parents' child, just like in terms of filial piety, you never give up looking after your parents. And if anything, that's kind of part of the reason why you exist as their child. I also really like the difference in the different stories there because it highlights the fact that even in China, where there's such an emphasis on, you know, studying really hard, going to school, going to university and getting a good job, it's never that simple because there are so many differing social factors at play at all times. It's not always in someone's best interest to get a white collar job at a big firm in a city really far away from their parents. It might not work for their their family situation. It might not be personally what they want either, even though that, that might be what's best for them on paper. You know, if it works for them as a family, why should she try and find formal employment just so that it looks good on paper. There are other sort of positive things coming out of lack of employment for young people as well, which is kind of nice to see, especially after the past few years where we've had trends such as like involution or lying flat where Chinese people, young Chinese people have been seen as giving up on themselves, on society, on everything. And one of those trends is basically van life (laughs) the chinese equivalent of like drifting or kind of just experiencing life to the fullest and not necessarily trying too hard to find your purpose or like your ideal career path too early on and instead trying to find out a bit more about yourself and a bit more about the meaning of your own life and that's also a that's also a reflection of the development of chinese society and china's economy right because obviously in the past with china being a developing and poor nation People didn't have time for that. (laughs) People had to go to work, they had to provide for their families, they didn't have the luxury of, you know, taking a few years out or just like roaming the country like it's like the unexplored western frontier of the US or something like that. Like people had to really knuckle down and, you know, it was very sink or swim in China in the 80s and 90s. So it's nice to see that there are at least some young people who have been given that opportunity to have some breathing room and kind of explore who they are a little bit more. Last summer, Wade Ziyi's life fell apart. The 26 year old had spent years fighting to climb the ladder of middle-class Chinese life, moving to the Southern metropolis of Shenzhen, scoring a marketing job at a tech company and working grueling hours month after month to impress his bosses. I never said no to any assignments. My performance was one of the best. Then suddenly it was all over. As China's economy slowed amid months of COVID lockdowns, Wei's employer made a wave of layoffs. Wei lost his job and struggled to find a new one. Soon after, he had to leave Shenzhen for a cheaper city nearby. He appeared to be on the road to nowhere. But one year later, Wei says that he's happier than ever. He's decided to lean into his sense of rootlessness and embrace a drifting lifestyle. He's bought a van, filled it with decks and speakers, and now makes a living by hosting impromptu dance parties at different beach resorts across China's coastline. After I lost my job, I realised the meaning of life isn't about your job or your income level. I started to reconsider the values and goals of my life. I think in the West, it's quite typical to see people, especially young people, moving away from desiring that sort of steady corporate life especially if you come from a middle class background where you've already seen your parents go through that I think there's a lot of working class people or people who want social mobility who do aspire to that because that's more comfortable than the life they live but everyone wants a life more comfortable than they live so if you are a young or like a a young-ish person who wants to escape the nine to five drudgery in the west this is already quite a typical attitude but this is very very new for China And because it's so new, the mindset around it and the sort of social acceptance of it still hasn't quite settled and there's still some 
uh, underlying anxieties around trying to pursue something that isn't quite the norm. Xu Dapao had a job that many of her peers coveted before she started drifting, a position at a state-owned enterprise in Beijing with steady hours and ironclad job security. But in July 2022, she suddenly decided that she could no longer stand her unchanging 9am to 6pm lifestyle. The job was too stable for me to stay. I don't think this kind of life suits me. At first, I just wanted to relax and stay off on the road for a while, but it became unstoppable and then I became a so-called drifter. Over the past year, Xu has visited around 50 Chinese cities in more than 20 provinces. Often, she only stays in one city for two or three days and then moves on. Her next destination is usually selected at random. My friends call me a special forces tourist, she laughs. Life is about going with the flow, she says. I've been through a lot on the way, but I've ended up seeing the most beautiful scenery. Xu also knows that drifting is just a temporary escape. Her parents have been supporting her during her travels, but now they're urging her to settle down. Whenever she thinks about the future, anxiety wells up inside her. Most people my age aren't spending as much time having fun outside as me. I feel a lot of pressure thinking about that. So I think the overall message is that the job landscape in China is changing. Opportunities for young people are changing. This doesn't just mean that people need new skills and to understand the job market better, which they do. And universities, colleges should prioritise skills development over just pure education, which is a shift that, again, the government has to initiate because they control education in China. But it also means initiating that change of perspective, not only among young people, but also among society in general. So their parents, their peers, their teachers, everybody. I think as China becomes more and more middle class and moves even more into becoming like other Western countries in terms of the level of development, personal income, cultural interests and things like that, people are going to be more and more interested in pursuing an alternative lifestyle. That doesn't necessarily mean that people will all want to be influencers, like uh, young people in the West are purported to all want to become influencers when they grow up. But I think that in general, there'll be a shift in in what's seen as desirable, what's seen as stable, what's seen as attainable as well. I think what young people in China will eventually discover, like what young people in the West have discovered, is that a life beyond what you were told was attainable when you were young is something that's achievable and it's more of a self-education process a Zoran <laughs> process if you will you have to self-actualize you have to make that discovery for yourself not just rely on the path that's set out for you but also try the path less taken and i think if china is able to come out of that mindset of sort of like dan ways and iron rice bowls and fixed stable incomes then young people especially will be less beholden to economic ups and downs and they will become more resilient in the face of you know economic crashes global lockdowns anything that comes their way especially as globalization isn't going anywhere and so the ability to lean into that as opposed to being buffeted by that is going to become a core soft skill so that's it for this episode everyone thank you so much for listening watching however you're consuming this content once again, do follow me on Substack. If you're watching on YouTube, subscribe, press the like button, share it with people if you thought it was interesting. Thank you all for your support. Find me on Twitter, find me on Instagram. The Buy Me A Coffee video is coming out, I think this week. It is going to be about the fact that Timu wrote me a letter after I did my last video. And so that video is going to be talking about that letter and sort of like my response to it because I'm not writing back to the email because that would be crazy. But I do want to talk a little bit about what I would say in response. So if you're interested in that, head over to my Buy Me A Coffee and yeah, you can watch the video there. But yeah, I'll see you later, guys. Bye.